Okay, we're going to start our lesson here on fiscal policy, and fiscal policy is pretty simple. You guys who have uh, AP government have already talked a little bit about it with Mr. Carey, but in short, really all it is is, well, you can see the pictures that are above here, so we'll start with the definition. It's very simple. Um, fiscal policy is any step taken by the government to alter the economy. So we know that the economy has a natural way of flowing. Um, we learned that when we did the circular flow model and the business cycle. When that flow seems to get out of whack and we want to actually make it do something else, the government often steps in. That's called fiscal policy. Very simple definition. Fiscal policy takes two forms, and I want to make sure that you guys are clear on the difference. This is not a big deal, but let's mention it at least once. The first form is what's called an automatic policy. And an automatic policy is, is simple in the sense that it just, it's anything the government does that doesn't require a new law. Um, so, for example, if people earn more money, let's say, you know, you know, I think everyone knows the government taxes income as a percentage of how much money you make. So if I make $100 and the tax rate is 10%, then I pay $10 in taxes. But it also means that if I pay, make $200, then I pay $20 in taxes. Now, taking it more money out of the economy, $20 instead of $10, is an example of fiscal policy. It's an example of how the government is automatically changing as people in the country get wealthier, the government gets wealthier. Um, by the same token, a good example of automatic is when we have a really bad recession and more people lose their jobs, um, the go go government automatically pays out more in welfare and Social Security and um, Medicaid and things like that. So automatic policies happen really by themselves. The, just nothing new has to happen in order for them to, to change. Then there's the opposite. There's what's called discretionary policies. Discretionary policies are policies that you do need a new law to put in place. Um, a good example, the one I put here, is if Congress votes uh, after, let's say, a hurricane to send money to North Carolina. Um, the, normally, that wouldn't be something that's built into the normal plan, right? That has to be something that's approved specifically for a, a purpose. Um, a really good example of a discretionary policy would have been the stimulus package that was passed by Congress a couple of years ago, where um, President Obama and the Congress spent something like $850 billion to, <coughs> excuse me, to spread money around and to, and to uh, you know, really try to get the economy going. That wasn't in the normal plan. So they had to had to pass the laws and had to have them approved to make that happen. So really simple difference. Automatic is when it happens really without anyone doing anything new. Discretionary happens only when someone, whether it's Congress and the president, makes a new law. Um, and that's that's pretty simply the case. Okay. All right. So when we talk about fiscal policy, 99.9% .9 of the time we're going to be talking about aggregate demand, not aggregate supply. So let's talk about it. When we want to affect aggregate demand, if we're the government and we want to affect aggregate demand, how can we do that? Well, there's actually two ways. The first is to change income taxes or really change any tax on the consumer. So it could be sales taxes, could be your Social Security tax, could be uh, your income tax, any taxes that's on the average guy. And it's really simple. They come in two forms. And these are words we've come across before, but we haven't really used them just yet, uh, at least not in this context. They come in what's called the expansionary form. An expansionary, as you guys know, increases AD. So what do you want to do if you want to expand the economy? The answer is you would cut taxes. Now, why would you cut taxes? Here's why. If you cut taxes, then more money goes back into the hands of the average person. And therefore, the average person can spend more money on things like cars and televisions and food and whatever else they might like to spend it on. Remember, there's four parts to the aggregate demand curve, C, I, G, and X. By cutting taxes, the C and the I can easily get bigger because people have more money in their pockets to spend. The opposite is what's called a contractionary policy. Contractionary policy would be the opposite, and that is going to decrease AD, which would be increasing taxes. If the government increases taxes, now there's less money in people's hands to spend on whatever they want, and so AD has to decrease. Now, really quick point here. This is kind of a side note, but somebody might say to me, well, Mr. Hooper, if we're cutting taxes, for example, to create expansionary policies, that's all fine because the people will have more money to spend, but then won't the government have less money to spend, and isn't government also one of the things that's a part of the, the AD? The answer is yes, but here's the thing. What you're assuming in that case, which I guess would be reasonable, 
But what you're assuming is that the amount of money the government takes in, taxes, and the amount they spend are connected, and, and they're not. That's how we got into this $14 trillion debt that we have now in this country. So, and in fact, for the last 10 years, we really have cut taxes and increased spending all at the same time. So don't connect those two. Even though I know it would seem reasonable to do that, keep them separate. If you want to expand the economy, cut taxes. If you want to increase the, the economy, or excuse me, contract the economy, increase taxes. Okay, so I kind of alluded to it a minute ago, but the other tool that you have to attack fiscal policy is government spending. You can change that. And again, very simply, if you're expansionary, you would spend more. If you're contractionary, you would spend less. Plain and simple. And in fact, to the right there, you see uh, President Obama's budget for the 2012 year that has just been proposed to Congress. It definitely won't work out that way. But that's, uh, that's one of the president's jobs, I think, as everyone knows, to present a budget. And he's changed a lot of the spending in that budget from the previous year. But as far as this slide goes, guys, the key point really is, what are the two things we need to know? We need to know that we have two tools to use, changing taxes and changing government spending. OK, so when, we, when would we use each tool? Well, pretty straightforward. If you have a recessionary gap, which means unemployment is too high, what do you want to do? you want to increase AD. And to do that, you want an expansionary policy. So you could choose either increasing spending or cutting taxes. Either one would work. Now, the reality is, guys, people would say, well, which one do I choose? For our, the purposes of this class, don't worry about that. It's sort of a philosophical thing in some ways. Republicans, for example, prefer cutting taxes. Democrats would usually prefer increasing spending. Um, not always, but generally that's a pretty good pretty good rule of thumb so you can see how it's different depending on your philosophy for our purposes in this class that's not something we need to get into um, so if you choose increasing spending or cutting taxes in a recession you're gonna be fine um, if you have an inflationary gap meaning the economy is going too fast it's overheating and inflation is getting hard you want to slow it down so you would want to use contractionary policies and so there you would either increase taxes or cut spending again you can memorize all this, guys, but I, I would think it probably is better if you just think about it and say, well, what would make sense? If, if my economy is going too fast and I want to slow it down, what's the fastest way to slow it down? Stop spending and raise taxes. If my economy is not going fast enough, I want to speed it up. Expansionary, I'd want to increase the amount I spend and cut taxes. All right. Now, obviously, if you had full employment, everything is good. So what do you do there? Hopefully, if you're the government, you're smart enough to leave everything alone and not touch it. Um, graphically, the first one is a recessionary gap. We've seen this already. And you can see that you would use expansionary policy to shift AD from AD1 to AD2 back to full employment. And on the second graph, you'd have an inflationary gap. And there you'd want to use contractionary policy to slide AD1 back to AD2. Okay, so very simple. Not a lot to memorize here. Cool. So now if we do an example for you, Let's try this. Um, suppose the economy is below full employment. We have a recession. What fiscal policy action should the government take? So at this point, I would say push pause for a second and figure out an answer. And in about two seconds, I will give you the correct answer. OK, the correct answer is you would either want to cut taxes or increase spending. Not, not too complicated at all. Uh, at this point, what I'd like to ask you guys to do is take a stop for a second and work on activities one and activities two. Check your answers. Make sure that you feel comfortable with what you're doing. And then you're going to come back and, uh, and continue this slideshow. So there's more to the slideshow. Just get to this point. Really quick, in activity one, don't worry about columns D and E. They're about budget debts and deficits. You may be able to figure them out, but don't worry about it for now. We're going to spend more time on that later in the course. OK, so now we're going to continue our lesson. Um, the question I want to just mention before we wrap up the demand side is, are these two, two tools created equal? And the answer is actually no, they're not. Um, really simple. Government spending is always a bit more powerful as an expansionary tool than cutting taxes is. And if you think about it for a second, it kind of makes sense. If the government spends money, right, what's one of the components of GDP? G, government spending. So if the government spends money, if they spend $100, all $100 goes right into the G. But the opposite side is also true. If the government cuts taxes 
And we know that everyone saves some of the money they get back. So the government cuts taxes by $100, and let's say people save 10% of their money. That means that of that $100 that was cut, 10% of it won't ever make it into the economy. There, people will spend 90%, they might spend $90, but not the whole thing. So for that reason, we know government spending is always a little more powerful than cutting taxes as an expansionary tool. Good thing to remember, and definitely would be a question somewhere along the way. Um, really quick, why does traditional fiscal policy not always work, and why do we have some other theories? The first is easy, um, really because it only impacts AD. It solves one problem, but usually makes the other one worse. Um, so the question then becomes, what do you do if you have high inflation and high employment, which you guys know we call stagflation? The answer to that was a policy originally come what, that we call supply side. And supply side goes by a couple different names. Um, it goes by the guy who originally came up with it, good old Ronald Reagan. Sometimes it's called Reaganomics. Um, sometimes it's also called, not usually a very nice phrase, trickle-down economics, and definitely not a nice phrase, it was actually his vice president who called it this, uh, voodoo economics. And the basic idea, guys, was that instead of increasing AD, you should try and increase AS because then both inflation and unemployment would decrease. Now, that makes pretty good sense. And if you look to the right there, you see the graph. What, we, what do we want to do? We want to push that AS curve, which had gotten bumped up back to the left. You want to push it back down to the right, back to full employment. And in that case, it's true. Supply-side policies would make a lot of sense. If you're going to do supply sides and not demand sides, then there's two things to use. The first is that you would want to cut business taxes. Remember, what's one of the big things that affects AS? The big thing is the cost of production. Well, the taxes that we charge our businesses are one of their costs of production. So if we stop charging all the car manufacturers um, a tax on, I don't know, um, on, on the tires that they use, that would make those tires cheaper and would therefore increase AS. So anytime we cut business taxes, or we sometimes call them corporate taxes, that shifts AS back to the right. It's one of the reasons that a lot of people favor this as a way to go. Okay. We also, some people would say we want to reduce regulations. Regulations are things that governments have to, that, excuse me, businesses have to apply, uh, abide by, like safety regulations and rules about reporting, uh, reporting information about their company, things like that. The more regulations a company has, the more tricky it is to do business, the more, the more things they have to consider. Um, not to say that regulations are necessarily bad. A lot of safety regulations are good, but the more regulations... It, it, no question, the more regulations there are, the more expensive it is to operate. Okay, so some people would say, we'll reduce those regulations and you'll make some more money. Um, the only problem with this situation here, there's a couple of them. First, stagflation isn't that common. Um, recession and overheating is much more common. So AS really only works when we have a stagflation situation. So it's not usually the best way to go um, unless we specifically have that problem. The second thing is, is the idea it was called trickle-down economics because the idea was is that if they spent all this money on the businesses, it would eventually trickle down to the average person. Um, history has shown that that didn't necessarily happen, and you can see the little cartoon to the right there that was taken of uh, Reagan and his friends. I don't think that was meant they're laughing about really trickle-down economics, but somebody who was being sarcastic obviously thought that would be funny. Um, it, it didn't really do that as much as they wanted it to. Um, and the other thing which is true is it's not that powerful. Business taxes are a very small percentage of the money the government takes in, whereas the income taxes that we talked about in the last part of this lesson, there's a lot of those. And so there's a limited amount that you can do to improve the economy through business taxes. But if you get asked the question about doing supply side or affecting a stagflation, cutting business taxes is probably your best answer. And then lastly, guys, in this last little bit we have here, you can do a quick try. If the economy was, was at full employment and there was a supply shock, which would be a sudden decrease in AS, what policy might the government undertake? Okay. Hopefully, your answer is cutting business corporate taxes or reducing regulations on companies. I think cutting business taxes are the best. All right, really last quick one. This is actually nothing really to do with supply side, but a lot of times it gets associated with the people who liked this idea. Um, it's something that's not a huge big deal. It's called the Laffer Curve. Um, and the basic premise of the Laffer Curve is that as you increase the amount of taxes, 
um, that you put on people, the tax rates, at some point you actually get less taxes. And think about why that might be, um, and we'll talk about it more next week when you guys get back in class. This is not a huge big deal, but I thought I'd throw it here on the end. Okay, good luck with your activities. Post any questions you have to me at the bottom of the first module.